I wanted to start this one by giving you a little bit of a perspective of how I first saw this game on a demo disc. Uh, this one, to be exact. And that cinematic at the end showcasing parts of the game has lived on in my memory ever since that moment. That music was always on the tip of my memory, and eventually, many, many years later, I got a copy of this game for my birthday. And it was everything I thought it would be. Threads of Fate, an action RPG for the PlayStation 1, it's very true to its name. You have a small cast of characters whose storylines keep intertwining with each other because they're all hunting for the most powerful item in existence. A relic that has been created by the great beings called Aeons long, long ago, capable of granting any wish they desired. Have I caught your attention yet? As you probably have guessed with that intro, I absolutely adore this game. And because I adore this game, I have to say that I'm going to be talking about everything that comes to mind. So please, if you want to try this absolute little hidden classic, I suggest you turn off this video and give it a go. Uh, you won't regret it. And when you're done, come back to the video and you can, you know, appreciate the amazingness that is Threads of Fate. So in order to understand Threads of Fate, you first will need to know that while you have a choice of two characters Ruin meant to play, their storylines are not a part of the same greater story. And while they use the same story elements, they are separate in how they tell it. Uh, think about it like each one being an alternate timeline of the same events depending on who you're picking, while the other one you didn't pick plays a supporting role. Kinda. Well, now you're probably thinking, well, hey, that's kind of boring to play the same game twice. Uh, that's also not really the case here. Even though they start similarly, they both diverge into more unique scenarios as the plot develops. And because both of the stories are different enough, uh, we're going to kind of follow how I played through this game and start with Rue's playthrough. With Rue, you first see him with Claire, who has kind of taken care of him over the past few years, when um, out of nowhere, Big Hands McGee comes out to attack Rue. Claire gets in the way and gets backhanded to death, and uh, Big Hand McGee gets away. This starts Rue on his journey to find a thing called a relic that possibly has the power to bring Claire back. I'm going to describe Rue as a serious fellow who is very honest as well. Uh, he very much has that no-nonsense approach to a lot of things and clearly displays his intentions and thoughts. He's like the ideal party member that you wish you had. So fast forward three years later and with no real luck, his journey lands him in a small town called Corona. Oh, uh, look who's in the background there. I told you Mint was around. This is also the first time you meet the thieves Smokey and Blood. We're also looking to get some easy loot from whoever they find. Now, something to talk about here is that this game is kind of unique in a sense that instead of having a lot of unknown characters wandering about, you instead get a smaller cast of reoccurring characters that Rue or Mint will encounter several times throughout the course of the game. This is important later because I said so. Welcome to the small town of Corona. Here you'll find the basics like a couple inns, a tavern, shops, and whatnot. But we can get into more details later here because we heard a family has been gone for five days and their daughter, Elena, went out into the forest to find them, so let's go see what's up. Surprise! This is an action RPG. Yeah, so this game is actually really simple in terms of controls. Like, almost too simple. You have your standard moving and jump, uh, two ways of attacking, with one central ability for each of the characters. For Rue, his central ability is to transform it to the creatures of the last few he's killed. Uh, they utilize this quite interestingly, and I'll try to show you throughout the video. As for Mint, patience. We will get to her soon enough. Uh, so I guess I'll also talk about how levels work here. Just kidding, there are no levels. You gain your health and mana by quite literally using them. Casting stuff as creatures and getting hit a lot. And I wouldn't worry about being too low on health points or mana either, because mana potions and HP potions drop constantly. You're also getting mana by hitting monsters as well, so you pretty much never run out of that. Your actual attack and defense, on the other hand, only changes with gear and stat boosts, but I'll get to that in a bit. 
So Rue finds Smokey and Blood harassing Eleanor for food. So we kick their asses and they run away. Easy enough. Anyways, we find Eleanor's parents, Klaus and Mira. And uh, Klaus has a side hobby where he likes to try and research and find relics that, and he's been doing so for the past five years now. And Mira is a very supportive wife who puts up with his bullshit daily. Thank you, honey. So he tells us there's an atelier up ahead, and since he sprained his ankle, he is struggling to get to it. So we go ahead and clear the way for him. Here we kind of get our first taste of a puzzle, I guess? Kill dragon, turn into the dragon, and face the other dragon. I never said they were going to be difficult puzzles. Getting to the atelier, we encounter the guardian who's protecting this place. One easy fight later, and we can enter this atelier with Klaus not far behind. Here, we get our first introduction to Mint in all of her glory. She tries to take the key and book we found, but falls over and then runs away. Mint is the best character in this game. Remember this fact. Also, remember when I said the other character you don't pick plays kind of like a supporting role? Well, here it is. All right, get back to town and we are told that Klaus found out where the key unlocks and it's in the underground cavern. But before we go, I did say we could explore a bit, right? Well, let's start with the shops. Remember when I mentioned that rather simple gameplay? This carries over to items as well. You don't have healing potions or any items that you can use at all, really. All you have are the items you occasionally find to sell, monster tokens you get from killing monsters to sell as your main way of making money, and uh, these coins that work as your continues. Yeah, there's limited continues, but they're real generous with it, so I wouldn't worry about it. I ended both playthroughs with a spare 25-ish coins? So you're probably asking what we could do with this money, right? Upgrades! Stat boosts! Making donations to the church to get more continue coins! And, uh, milk? So, in essence, pretty much all of the game mechanics are... simple. And while some might think it's very bare bones, and it is, I can't deny that it pretty much had no impact on how much I enjoyed the gameplay here. The combat never got boring to me, and I wasn't distracted by needing the menu all the time. And because there's no levels, grinding was kept to the absolute minimum. Or if I did it, it was just to get some extra HP or mana, and I didn't really need to do that if I didn't want to. I always had enough money for upgrades, and I never felt weak at any point, so that was nice. Now that all that is done, let's meet with another character, Rod the Blade Star. Yeah, this guy is probably one of the better characters, solely because he has a dog called Johnny Wolf. Do you really need to know more? Winner in my book, 10 out of 10, absolute greatest of all time. Uh, just kidding. He's a swordsmith and a swordmaster, and came around to fight people and test out his gear. Uh, you can duel it for extra cash if you want, and as you progress, he also tries out new weapons on you. It's probably the only side story you're gonna get in this game. Okay, finally we keep going with the story. On to the underground cavern, and Mint shows up being, uh, Mint. You'll get it later. So, there really isn't much to talk about here for the most part. You got some winding caverns that's kind of confusing to go through, but you can just kind of wander and find the exit eventually. That's what I did anyway. There's also an environmental puzzle here that requires you to turn into a salamander and melt ice blocks. It also works pretty well to grind for mana here, since you need a fair bit to get through all the ice blocks for the goodies in the back. You eventually make your way to this boulder where Mint is attacking it to try and unlodge it. And one boulder run later, you open the path to the underground lake where Mint does Mint things and tries to kick Rue into the water so she can get to the atelier first. And fails. I love this part. One guardian fight later, yeah, he was also pretty easy. Just wait till he gets tired and whack him. Exploring Elroy's atelier, you find a cube you don't know how to open and a tiara that is a, uh, tiara. So, as you leave, you get introduced to two more characters, uh, Jesse and James, I mean, Belle and Duke. Treasure hunters in the search of a relic for that big payout. After a fight with Duke, Belle swipes the tiara and takes off. Rue makes his way back to Klaus with the cube, who, well, he doesn't know how to open the cube, he knows someone who does. Fancy Mel. So, the first time going to Fancy Mel's atelier is, uh, special. It's kind of hard to describe it, so I'll just show it to you.
she's got some kind of taste. Anyways, while waiting for Mel, you get to participate in the most frustrating part of the game. Three precision platforming challenges. These are not fun. And this game is not designed for this kind of platforming. Especially if you're using analog sticks, because for some reason the game reads the direction of the analog sticks just a little too long. It's kind of hard to describe, but I'll just say for these, I used the directional buttons for these and it felt a lot easier to make it through. At the end is some kind of minigame with the remaining time you have, but I never got a high score, nor do I care to try them again, so uh, meh. Fancy Mel, at least how I envision her, is an oddly calm person, and she knows a lot more than she's leading on, I think. And while agreeing to look at the box in exchange for finding her fourth popple pearl, uh, those dwarf things that we talked to outside in the minigames, she noticed something wrong with Rue. But she will talk to him about it next time. Hmm. Leaving, you probably find one of my favorite moments in the game. Duke in his ultimate form, Star. This fight is so dumb, but I love it, and gained all the appreciation for Duke after this. It's also an easy fight as well. Anyways, one beating up Smokey and Blood again in the same spot later, and the popples return. She provides you with the instructions on how to open a cube, and pops the question, you're not human, are you? This is one of the bigger reveals here. Rue woke up in a temple somewhere and has no memory of who or what he is, and he is determined to get Claire back. I'm pretty sure he tells everybody eventually. After walking past Mint and Elena, who also showed up, you get another reveal, the big baddie himself, Dollmaster. What an awful name, my dude. You could have called yourself anything else. Hell, your right-hand man, Psycho Master, sounds way cooler than Doll Master. You also see him here. I sense a theme coming along here. Back to Klaus we go. We open the box and a child pops out. Mint arrives behind you to inform you and Klaus that it's a doll and not a child, and it's your key to opening the seal to the relic located on Force Lake. Oh look, he's unconscious. Time for you to get some items. So Rue and Mint split up with Rue going to the ghost temple to get gloves and shoes, and Mint to Gamul Forest to get the earrings. Ghost temple was a pretty fun time, but there isn't too much to note for the first half at least. Lots of fighting dolls and skeletons and whatnot. It also makes for a good grinding spot with these infinitely respawning dolls. After fighting the Guardian three times, which were all trivial at this point for me, you managed to get everything except the last glove. On your way back to the entrance, the other entrance opened and you find Elena who followed you, and when you head back, BAM! Door closes on you. Time for escort mission. Once again, it's not actually that bad. This was probably the easiest escort mission I ever had to do. You just tell her where to go and most of the fights are scripted and you don't even involve her. So you run into Duke fighting the last, or the same Guardian. I'm not sure. And he gets the last glove. Another fight ensues between Rue and Duke, and Duke goes down. Elena wants to patch him up, and does much to Duke's objection. Then the wall starts to close on them, and we narrowly escape. Duke gets a bit of a change of heart here, and hands over the glove. Back to Klaus we go! Again. Okay, so we get the gloves and boots, and Mint comes back with the earrings, and now we only need the tiara and phantom ring. Mint says she's going to get the tiara from Belle and Duke, and Rue goes to get the phantom ring from Wyleth the dragon at the Raging Mountains. Another beatdown of Duke and Belle happens here, uh, with their machine the Hexagon this time. Uh, this fight is also easy. Most of the boss fights are easy. I'm not really complaining, just something I noticed. And we're at the top of the mountain. Wylaf the Great Dragon doesn't believe you're worthy to go after the relic, so he wants to test you in a fight. Uh, after you win, he gives you the Phantomite, and I don't know, he seems like a pretty chill dragon to be honest. I, I don't know why we had to fight. It's all good though. Back to Klaus we go! Again. Again. You get the Phantomite back and Mint gets the TR without fighting Duke and Bell. Kinda suspicious. This point you kinda have some time to kill. Blood and Smokey issued you a challenge to fight again, so why not? 
And here we meet their boss, Trapmaster. Master. Huh. Coincidence? I think not! You also need to recharge the Prima Doll by turning into some cat monster Mel points you towards. Okay, with the help of Rod to get us across the lake, we finally get ourselves ready to break the seal. Just kidding. Doll Master, Psycho Master, and some other character we're meeting for the first time, Princess Maya, shows up. Maya whips up her book of Cosmos, a relic she has, but Rue comes up from behind with a chair and cancels the power of the book. Doll Master decided to hand Rue his ass back, and Prima's like, nah, I ain't letting them take me, and turns himself into stone. Then out of nowhere, Mint, Duke, and Belle come riding the hexagon and saves Rue, while Maya spawns a giant f tower out of nowhere because reasons. So it probably feels like I'm straight up retelling all of the story, and yeah, I pretty much am. This game really doesn't have a lot of side content, and so all of this is literally main story stuff, and it's a game with not a lot of downtime either. Even then, I can't really skip the story beats either because they're all pretty interconnected with each other, so much so that missing anything feels like you cut out a major part of the story. Damn. I need a break, I'm talking too much. Oh shit, you're still here? Alright, so the four that escaped meet up at the bar after, and everything just comes out. Why Rue is going after the relic, why Mint is going after the relic, still saving that for later though. And Mint was plotting with Belle and Duke to swipe in and steal the relic from Rue. But not anymore, because Rue's story is sad, okay? How can we hurt the sad thing? He's too sad. So after this, Rue sees Claire wandering about and chases her without thinking this is an obvious trap. It's fine, it happens to all of us. So Rue is told after a fight with Psycho Master that he needs to go to the tower to save Claire or she is dead. Even though she is already dead. Fine. So of course he falls for this, and uh, oh look, Trapmaster locks you into the tower. I would have never have guessed he was working for Dollmaster. Not much goes on in this tower to be honest. You got a lot of pumpkin themed stuff, and there's one point where your worst enemy, Precision Platforming, comes back to slap you, but it's not the worst. Anyways, you make it to the top, and surprise surprise, Claire is not Claire, she is actually Mode Master. Like second to the last character intro, I swear. Dollmaster reveals that he is Big Hand McGee the whole time and uses Rue to break into the Book of Cosmos with Maya. And the Aeon of the book shows up and is like, Rue, you piece of shit, you're here to kill me because you're Valen's creation. Shit, did I mention that that relic is Valen's relic? And I also totally forgot if they named the relic here. It's called the Dew Prism, okay? Yeah, that thing. There's a lot going on. It's hard to keep track here. Trust me, I'm boiling this down as much as I can. So Dollmaster comes into the book and murders the Aeon, and we finally get all the lore we need to, so listen up. Both the Dollmaster and Rue are dolls created by Valen, meant to open the seal for Valen and let him free to rule the world. Oh shit, Dollmaster. Well, I get it now. The name is still shit, though. Anyways, Rue tells him to suck a big one, and Dollmaster is like, alright, fine, and creates Valen's Fortress to break the seal by forcing Prima Doll to do it. He also gained the ability to Von Petrify him somewhere along the way. Maya and Rue make it back to town, and now it's time for Rue to find out how to fly. Good thing he could transform into things, so he goes to ask the dragon, and he's like, oh yeah, sure, I don't care. He ain't gonna destroy the world or anything. Oh, and Trapmaster and Mode Master were here, but you trounced them, and they give up entirely. One fun scene you encounter after is Maya and Mint fighting each other because, surprise, they are sisters. And here they show you the most calm conversation between siblings. Can you guess what Mint called Maya here? This is how they bleep out swears in this game, by the way. Just use your imagination. I mean, I'm sure they are fine, leave them be. Time to finally go to the last area of the game. And to be honest, this is probably the least interesting part of the game. Which might be hard to believe, but hey, you watched this far, so you probably trust me, right? The arenas are kind of like trials with some light puzzling sprinkled in. 
There is, however, this one part where you need to light the middle torches in all the sections of a tower, and for some reason my brain could not comprehend this. I unironically was running around this for like a half an hour before figuring it out. Time for Psycho Master Fight Part 2. He's exactly the same as the fight in the church, except in a smaller area. And maybe like, one new ability? Yeah, the hardest part was trying to stay in the box, to be honest. After this is a boss rush, but it's so meh. I'll just not talk about it, okay? Time for the final showdown with Dollmaster. This fight is a test of patience more than anything. But once you figure out the pattern, you're fine. Keep your distance and just hit him once and back off. So yeah, you beat his ass and tell him that duty is lame and will is cool. And he's like, yeah, you're right, because you kicked the crap out of me. And now we finally get to the do prism. Valen himself comes out and he's like, my servant, you came for me. Wish for your Claire back. And so Rue does, and there she is. Just in time for Valen to be like, sweet, a body to possess, so I can use the do prism now and you can fuck off. So now Rue needs to fight Valen in Claire's body and his two things. This fight's a little annoying and it took a few tries. The best advice I can give is to smack the Dark Angel thing when he tries to do anything in case it wants to heal Valen. And just try your best to avoid anything and hit Valen when he decides to visit you on your side of the screen. Uh, we then beat Valen and he is forced out of the body and was like, Oh look, she was too weak to handle me, so I'm gonna use you, the doll, instead. And before he does, Dollmaster's like, nah. Rue has beaten sense into me, so I'm helping him now. And Valent merges with the Dew Prism to turn into some kind of pink monster thing. You gain the ability to block now for reasons, and you need it to block the boss's laser attack and counter him. Only when he turns more pink you can actually damage him, so he's just a dodge and wait kind of boss. Once again, once you figure out the pattern, it's a pretty easy fight. So now the fortress is crumbling and Rue is trying to get Claire out when Mint shows up to help with the help of Rod's boat. As they try to escape, Rue gets stuck in a cave with Claire and Mint has to ditch him. But hold on, Psycho Master saves them because reasons. All is well in the world. Rue gets Claire back, the Dew Prism is lost forever, and Mint is going back with Maya to the Eastern Kingdom to rule together and all is well. So at this point, we can move over to Mint's story but I think we need to address a few things beforehand. So I know I glossed over many of the characters in this so far, but I'm sure fans of this have might have noticed, those characters are really what make the game so special. With Rue, you have Mint you interact with a few times, going from not understanding each other at all, to eventually coming to at least trust each other somewhat. Rue's interactions with Duke and Belle are pretty intense the first few times, but they eventually come to understand what Rue is trying to do and actually want to help him. Rod was pretty much chill the whole time, but helps out Rue to get to the lakeside. Even Maya, who didn't get to interact with him much, notices his honest nature and how determined he is, and wants to help him after. All these characters get actual character development. Is this what good writing in video games feel like? Whew, what a rush. All of these interactions with these characters and all the dialogue feels perfectly in place and almost feels natural. In so many other games, you really do feel like characters are shoehorned in. But here, it feels like they're all connected and with purpose. Do you understand why it's called Threads of Fate now? I yeah, think the name is a little weird, but hey, it perfectly describes the game. So like I said before, you've really only played half of the game, and uh, now we get to Mint's storyline. And as I said before, while this operates with a lot of the same story beats, it is an alternate timeline kind of thing. Like if Mint was the one who found the bandits first at the beginning, and the one who was spearheading, collecting everything and whatnot. So this is how we're going to tackle this, because I'm sure you don't want to hear everything again. And I think we're going to go over a few parts that were different with Mint's playthrough, and then we can kind of just keep going where the story diverges, okay? Mint, or Princess Mint, is a spoiled, self-centered girl who runs away from the kingdom after losing her spot as next on the throne to her sister, Princess Maya. 
Oh yeah, and Dollmaster was here the whole time, which makes me think you're supposed to play her story second. Just a thought. And so, she's after the relic to overthrow her sister and world domination. Yeah, you heard me. World domination. Unlike Rue, she is the complete opposite of him, and is pretty much a smart-ass, cocky, hot-headed, and possibly murdered a few people kind of princess. Uh, and she is the best character in the game, for real this time. Look at that smug face of success. You know what? While I'm on it, let's talk graphics and music for a minute here. This game was made fully 3D, which is not only impressive considering how detailed this game looks, but the character designs and movements are also pretty damn amazing. This is the one PS1 game where I can say you can see how a person is feeling through visual movement and their faces. Which was a rather rare sight in this time period, mind you. Square does such a good job with this here. What they didn't do the best job at here is the environments. They're not super varied here, and while you do have some standouts, of course it feels like the theme of forest or rock comes up a lot more than anything else. Uh, despite that, I'm going to sound crazy, but I actually believe this game holds up graphic-wise. Uh, you don't have to agree with me, but I believe what I believe. As for the music of the game, it's okay. There are some really good tracks here, like the intro cutscene you heard at the beginning of the video. And the music they use for the creepier or evil parts is honestly pretty dreadful feeling. And lastly, there is one soundtrack that I think is literally designed to pump you up and get ready for the big thing to happen. Okay, let's get back on track. So in Mint's playthrough, she picks fights with pretty much everyone and it's hilarious. What's even funnier is she can back it up because she's legitimately strong. For the first while, you were following pretty similar story beats, but with a Mint style of differences. Okay, so I said we would go over a special ability, right? Well, she uses magic. And while it's also simple, it probably uses one of the better magic systems I played with. You see, she starts with only two elements and gains more in the story, and that's all fine. But if you hit up and down on any of these elements, you can get different effects. For example, this light magic here has a rapid fire, but you can also change it to a spread shot. She is very good in area of effect magic, and in my opinion, she's much more fun to play than Rue, simply because of her magic system. Now, in my playthrough, I only found like one of these effects called Super, but I'm sure there are more hidden about. So here I'm going to list some highlights before we get to where things diverge. So, she still saves Elena here, but dropkick blood in the face twice. And by the end of the game, I think they're legitimately scared of her. She meets up with Klaus, who can read her like an open book, and kind of messes with her a little bit too. Now, Rue, now as a supporting character in this playthrough, actually plays like a sad man, and quite literally feels like he's just bogged down. It's kind of a weird difference because in Rue's playthrough, Mint is kind of in your face every time and is trying to be involved in every affair, whereas Rue is just kind of just goes with the flow of things. I don't know, it was a weird contrast for me. Rod treats her pretty similarly and that's fine. She also drop kicks him. I'm pretty sure that's her greeting at this point. Now here we get the first big difference with Mint's playthrough and you get this starting at Elroy's Atelier in the underground caverns. When Duke and Belle come out, it seems that Belle has interacted with Mint before. Certainly Mint left a good impression, I bet. And anyways, Mint calls her old and, uh, oh. So yeah, Belle took this personally and fights Mint herself. Arguably a bit more fun of a fight, but the same result happens and the tiara gets stolen. One moment that got a laugh out of me is Mint meeting Mel. Even leading up to it, you can tell that Mint's like, Dang, this place is ugly. And when she gets to the door and no one answers, she just fucking goes at it. Now in this instance, Mel is helping Mint not to actually help her, but to teach her a lesson in not messing with shit beyond her control. As if Mint actually cared. 
She still saves the Popple Pearl and returns it. And you still fight Starlight Duke here as well, but Elena's with you now, so that's a little out of place. You still get the Dull Master reveal here, but now it's even funnier this time because he finds out Mint of all people are going after this relic. Ironic. So the same situation with the Prima Doll is here, but now you get to go to Gamma Forest. But because it's a week away by foot, you go get Rod's help here, and the interaction between these two are also pretty funny. Mint just loves to piss off people, doesn't she? Before you even get to the dungeon part, you get to fight Belle on her hexagon. Which makes sense, because at the time Duke is fighting Rue at the Ghost Temple. Eh, not a bad fight, still easy. Gamu Forest, on the other hand, is... eh. They have a trolley puzzle here, but that's really it. Though, towards the end, you run into Belle, who's also running from the, uh, forest creatures. And they end up falling off into, like, a raft on a lake. And Mint gets hurt here. Belle actually heals her, because Belle isn't really all that bad of a person, as we know later on. And then she gets swallowed by this area's guardian. And this fight was probably the most challenging guardian fight. Not that it was hard to dodge or anything, but because I couldn't hit him without falling into the water. That was annoying. I also found out something interesting here. Mint actually gets resistances to certain elements, depending on what magic is equipped, which is actually pretty cool. It made this fight trivial because instead of taking 7 damage it hit, I only took 1 damage because I was holding on to the ice magic. So you beat the Guardian and it spits out the earrings and bell, and Mint being Mint is like, eh, she'll be fine, and it just fucks off. <laughs> yeah, she's still my favorite character. So next difference I want to talk about is Mint's interaction with Wild After Dragon. This girl is so damn full of confidence that after she beats the dragon, she's like, you know what? You can work under me if you want. And the dragon's like, you know what? Maybe. <laughs> I also like her scene fighting the Trap Master. Straight up calling him a porcupine because of his hair. And after beating Trap Master, Smoking and Blood looking at her like, uh, no thanks. And then she spots him. She's like, I'm still pissed. Get over here. And yeah, it kind of felt bad for them here. So, same stuff happens here with Prima Doll needing power, and Mint providing it with lightning magic instead of transformation. Uh, there is also a nice moment, well, as nice as Mint makes it, because she still insults Prima, but cheers him up at the same time. Alright, so now we get to a point where Prima is going to unlock the seal, and here's where the storyline splits off a bit. So, Maya and Dollmaster confronts Mint, and of course Mint's gonna fight back, but gets flattened by a pumpkin. Did I ever tell you that Mint despises pumpkins? Yeah, I don't get it either. She gets, like, unreasonably mad when she sees them. So at this point, Rube come out to save them, but instead of saving Mint, they just run away with Prima Doll. With Rube promising that he will come back for Mint. Probably. The Tower of Maya is spawned again, and Mint is tossed into the dungeon. There is also a scene around here where Dollmaster was trying to convince Maya to get the relic for themselves, but she refuses. This is important, by the way. So Rue does actually come back to save Mint, and the whole escape sequence happens, which is cool. After this, they meet up at the bar again like last time, and Rue tells a story, and Mint tells her story, and how her story is sadder than Rue's story. No, it's not. So at this point of the story, Psycho Master approaches Mint in the town and says, If you don't return Prima Doll, they are going to destroy the town under orders of Princess Maya. Which Mint is like, eh, that's not like her foreshadowing so the dolls and monsters you see at the ghost temple start attacking the surrounding forest and mira's stuck out there fighting somebody well we make it out there and mira is kind of a badass holding up her own against the trap master so we make it back and klaus is grateful but the matter remains is where they are getting all these dolls they suspect it's either the ghost temple or the underground caverns. So Rue goes back to the ghost temple and Mink goes to the underground caverns where Maya is there being evil. We go through this place again and when we finally run into Maya, she's like, ha, think about it. Both you and Rue are out doing stuff. So who's defending the town? An oh shit moment indeed. Back at the town, Dollmaster is calling out the townsfolk, threatening them all. Duke and Belle are trying to hold them off, but they get punted. When Mint shows up, Psycho Master teleports her to the church to keep her away. Uh, beating Psycho Master and coming out surprises Doll Master even more. And while Klaus is defending Prima Doll, the Prima Doll doesn't want to see Klaus die, so he turns himself in and they all take off. Surprise! Valen's Fortress is back! 
At this point, Rue is like, oh no, we're doomed. Because you got to remember, this story's Rue is sad, Rue. Mint cheers him up and goes back to the Tower of Maya to finally confront Maya herself. So here, the tower is pretty much the same as before, except Trapmaster is waiting for you towards the top. Kick his butt and let him live, because Mint isn't all that evil. Come on now. This legitimately surprises Trapmaster, by the way. She meets Maya at the top of the tower and a fight ensues. This fight is actually quite fun, since she has the ability to turn Mint into a pumpkin, and you gotta run away from her so she doesn't kick you. Beating Maya reveals that she is really Mode Master. What a surprise! No one saw that coming. The real Maya is actually locked in the prison below, but Mode Master shows up again as Maya, and now Mint has to choose who the fake Maya is. Uh, well, joke's on Mode Master, because Mint don't give a shit. I was actually surprised there wasn't an option to punch both of them. So I guess I chose right, and Mint is like, yeah, I had no idea, I just kind of guessed. I'm kind of on Maya's side at the moment here, because Mint is scary, and a force to be reckoned with. So, Maya needs a place to hide, since Mint is like, yeah, the town's gonna hate you. Probably a lie. And takes her to stay with Mel instead. Probably a punishment. At this point, talking with Mel and Maya, you figure out that it's a dupe prism you're after, and that Mint is still very much after world domination. I also think Maya is legitimately scared at the thought of Mint getting this relic. Another thing to note here is Mint actually gaslights herself here and thinks Dollmaster is the reason she got the throne. You keep thinking that, Mint. So now Mint needs to find a way to get up to Valen's fortress, and lo and behold, Rod's boat can fly too, and he just needs five of these cannon orbs. You already got one from Mel, because she can see the future or something, I swear. There's one in the back alley shop for 100 million gold. Mint charges it to the kingdom and is like, Welp. Bell and Duke have one that powers the hexagon, but will only give it on the condition that Mint helps Rue out with his dream of saving Claire. For the last orb, Rod and Duke actually went out to get it from Wylaf, and Rod gets hurt in the process of fighting the dragons, so he asks Duke to drive the boat to the fortress instead. So, this fortress is exactly the same as last time, so I'm just gonna skip this part. But one thing to mention here is Psycho Master legit recognizes how strong Mint is, and goes all out. It's the same fight as last time, but hey, it's still annoying. There is a funny scene after where Mint and Psycho Master agree to a magic duel, and they count down and Mint's like, oh look, a pumpkin, and then drop kicks Psycho Master. It's just amazing. Even the fight with Doll Master has some great dialogue, because Mint's like, how dare you get me kicked out of my kingdom, and Doll Master's like, what? Man, that was your fault. I had no decision in that. Anyways, this fight with Dollmaster is different than Rue's story. Also, speaking of Rue, he's here and unconscious for some reason. I was wondering where he was. The Dollmaster fight is fun because you still have to be patient with him, but now he uses magic. Anyway, she beats him and she's like, ha, loser, and off he goes. Mint, you are just brutal. So she actually drags Rue in with her to get the Dew Prism, and here Valen, instead of taking over Claire, he takes over Rue instead. It's the same fight though, so yeah. He then gets expelled from Rue's body, since Claire's spirit ousted him. And then Maya shows up somehow and gives Mint the power of the Book of Cosmos to power up a pendant she got from Prima at the start of the fortress. Hey, if I mention every detail of the story, this video would be double in length. The same final boss fight happens here, but instead of blocking, she has a magic shield, and she doesn't even need to fight back. Just block the laser and let him kill himself. So after this, the fortress is falling apart, and Duke comes to grab Rue. A little ways in, Maya notices Mint is overexerting herself, and she falls on the floor and can't move anymore. Maya tells Duke to go, and she will stay with Mint. And I get it, she can't leave her sister. So she defends her from waves of monsters, and it seems like all is lost until Maya hits the Book of Cosmos a bunch, and it gives it just enough power for her to teleport them back. In this version of the story, Rue doesn't get Claire back. The Dew Prism is lost forever anyways, and uh, Mint still goes back to the East Kingdom with Maya to rule the kingdom together. Congratulations, you beat both stories! And as a bonus, you get some extra cutscenes. Rue and Maya are now on a mission to get all of Valen's dolls and stop them from being evil. And Mint receives a letter from Klaus that they found the location of another relic. So she goes to get Rue and pulls him away on another adventure. But you might have noticed something here. Yep, Claire is alive here. 
which means Rue's story is probably the canon one. And that's the story of Threads of Fate. It's a really interesting route this game takes. Instead of a story on a grand scale, it's instead it's a simple story that feels contained and personal to everyone involved. And while Min's story is non-canon, her interactions with everyone has got to be some of my favorite delivery of dialogue I encountered. She riles up everyone all the time, and I swear she is scarier and uh, possibly more evil than Dollmaster at times. I really feel like I can gush about the writing of these characters all day, but in the end I still think you should experience this game for yourself. I left a lot of things out, and uh, while you know the story, that's not why this game is so good. You, it's the characters, all of them. You got Rue, Mint, Bell and Duke, Rod, Klaus, and the Prima Doll, and even Blood and Smokey. They're all characters you come to enjoy and even cheer for. Hell, you even get a bit of admiration for Dollmaster. He treats his subordinates with respect and depends on them, and they treat him with admiration and absolute loyalty. And uh, thinking back, I don't think there's a character that I don't like. They're all so natural, and the development and interaction while they're all vie for the relic? I, re I really do recommend this game. So after all of this, and while writing for this video, I looked this game up on Wikipedia. Don't judge me. While the game sold poorly, it really had quite the impact over at Squaresoft at the time. It became a favorite for some of the staff, and I think if it ever gets a sequel, it would be a passion project among those at Square Enix. Apparently, Daisuke Watanabe, a writer for Square Enix, and with Threads of Fate as his first project there, highlighted that Threads of Fate gave him the confidence in writing female characters, and it helped him with his work on characters such as Yuna and uh, Lightning from the Final Fantasy series. Even Junya Nakano credits Threads of Fate in shaping his music style for Final Fantasy X. From the little demo I saw way back when to playing the game for the first time helped shape my appreciation for game development and realize that it really is an art form in itself. I really do appreciate you watching me gush about this game that I hold near and dear to me, and uh, I hope you give this game a shot as well. Thank you so much for watching. This video was on my bucket list, and I'm glad I was able to make it, and I really hope you enjoyed this video as well. Balinator, signing out. Have a good one.